ان الحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ به من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد ان محمدا عبد الله ورسوله ارسله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا ثم اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وان شر الامور محدثاتها وان كل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار يقول سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بعد ان اقول اعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ربنا لا تجعلنا فتنه للذين كفروا واغفر لنا ربنا انك انت العزيز الحكيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقده من لساني يفقهوا قولي امين يا رب العالمين ان شاء الله ان تريس خطبه what i'd like to share with you are some reflections from the quran uh, but inspired really by the events the tragic events that have taken place in france and apparently in the news today continue to take take uh, place these kinds of things every time they come in the news the muslim mind almost freezes up we get paralyzed how are we supposed to respond to this we we are barely done dealing with one tragedy and another one hits in the news and another one and another one and they are of different kinds sometimes they are, these are events in which some things are done to muslims and other cases where muslims have done some things to others and in both cases we are left completely baffled as to what an intelligent response is supposed to be or how we're supposed to deal with this not only as individuals but also as a community and in a larger sense as an ummah the first thing i want to start i really ha- have basically four or five things to share with you today inshallah and i hope despite the frustration that you and i both feel about what is going on that i hope that i'm able to be uh, uh, you know coherent and consistent in the ideas that i want to present before you the first thing that i want to share with you is just a f- statement of fact criminals are criminals it doesn't matter what religion they have when someone's a murderer and they murder someone who didn't deserve to be killed it does not matter that they're muslim or christian or jewish or atheist the they are equal before the law and they're equal before the eyes of the muslims just because someone commits a crime and they are a muslim they are not any less guilty in my eyes or your eyes that is not the case don't confuse the fact that inna mal mu'minuna ikhwa all believers are brothers that that should somehow confuse your sense of justice actually allah azza wa jalla in the quran very very clearly tells us to stand by justice walaw walaw ala anfusikum even if standing by justice means you have to stand against your own selves when muslims have done something wrong then it is something wrong and it's you, you cannot hide around it you cannot beat around the bush and the the easy cop out for a lot of people when it comes to justice is they confuse justice with retaliation justice with retaliation what i mean by that is when someone does something wrong i'll give you a childish example so this point becomes clear when one of your kids does something wrong and you tell them you've done this wrong and they say well my brother did it well he did it too you know what anybody else doing something wrong does not justify your crime you are responsible for your crime and you cannot deflect and say well what about them no 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 we'll deal with them separately that's a separate problem don't confuse their problem with what you've done you know so you alaykum ma humiltum you you have to carry your own burden what you've been loaded on with allah azza wa jalla doesn't allow us to take credit for other people's work and allah azza wa jalla doesn't allow us to justify our misbehavior given other people's misbehavior he doesn't allow us to do it laha ma kasabat wa lakum ma kasabtum they have what they earned and you have what you earned that's the first point that i wanted to make the second is that these people they are in fact an embarrassment people that in the name of islam or muslims when they commit heinous acts and they are an embarrassment to the muslim community but they are more than that we are embarrassed and we are humiliated by what's happened there's no way around it and yes i am not a criminal i haven't done anything but i do share something with them these people are muslim or at least they claim to be right and they apparently done in the name of islam or whatever it may be so long as that claim is there i have something in common with them at least a word at least a word and that enough is a humiliation so now i want to address what what does that mean for you and me 
The first, first and foremost, we need to understand something. We have to take collective responsibility. And that'll be the last part that I talk about in my khutbah today. What does it mean to take collective responsibility? The ummah is in chaos and every single member, every single citizen of this ummah, his and her responsibility is to do something to undo that chaos. We have to do whatever we can in our capacity. Yes, we cannot get rid of chaos in the world. And we cannot get, a, get rid of fanaticism and craziness. We can't get rid of it. But we at least have the responsibility to do our part, at least our part. But know one thing for sure. One of the things that's spreading the chaos and helping further this, this craziness is that in the minds of some Muslims, these people are actually somehow justified. Somehow what they did must be in some sense Islamic. And I want to just tell you unequivocally without any confusion or any shadow of a doubt, I've been trying to understand this deen for well over a decade now and I, am, I have no doubts or no confusion in my mind. There's nothing Islamic about any of this. There's nothing even close to Islamic about any of this. As a matter of fact, I, don't, I, I personally give you the advice and I give my children the advice and I give my friends the advice. Don't watch those cartoons or those YouTube videos or those disparaging comments or read those books. I don't ask you to read that stuff. I don't even want you to look at it because it's not worth your time. It's not worth it. But I will tell you one thing. As offensive as those cartoons may be, it is equally offensive to do something in the Prophet's name, in Islam's name, in Allah's name, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that is against the teachings of Islam. It is equally offensive. When they are spreading filthy propaganda against Islam, by insulting the religion, you're spreading a, another kind of propaganda against Islam, by, by you know, spreading hate and killing and you know, injustice, and, and calling that the deen of Allah. That is also a crime. And we are equally offended by that too. That is a crime in and of itself. This is the second point that I wanted to bring to your attention. They have no justification. Some people like to quote the example of Ka'ab bin Ashraf, who was a famous poet at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, half Arab and half Jewish, who was actually extremely, he had extreme animosity towards the Prophet of Allah ﷺ. As a matter of fact, there are a number of occasions where he tried to corner Muslims and get, convince them to do exactly the opposite of what Allah would want them to do or what the Messenger would want them to do ﷺ. And ayat came specifically about his conversations on multiple occasions. And this guy is so bad that his poison Draw, drew the attention of Allah Azza wa Jalla and Ayat came responding to him. He's just not, he's no ordinary enemy of Islam. And some people confuse his story because he was also a poet. And he made filthy poetry about the women, Muslim women, by name. He would make filthy poetry about Muslim women by name. Not just poetry against the Prophet ﷺ, which is bad enough. But on top of that, the women of the Muslims. Now you, you and I imagine if somebody made dirty poetry about my daughter, about my sister, about my mother, you know, how would we respond? And it's actually, and then some people confuse his story and say, well, that's because he made this poetry that the Prophet ﷺ said, you know, man li Ka'ab, who's going to get rid of Ka'ab for me? And then, you know, a Sahabi got up and then he was, you know, he was finally killed. He was actually executed. It's because he made poetry. See, now we have justification that you don't have. You can just say whatever you want. This person made poetry and the Prophet ﷺ commanded that he should be killed. Hold on a second. This is the same man who actually attempt, attempted to kill the Messenger of Allah ﷺ by poisoning his food. And as a matter of fact, even the final attempt, the, the idea of poisoning the food of the Prophet ﷺ came from him. And there are multiple occasions on which he has shown, has made attempts to assassinate the Messenger of Allah وسلم, including a, cons a secret conspiracy he had with Abu Sufyan before he became Muslim, right after the loss of Badr, he met and had secret counsel with Abu Sufyan, among other instances. So to take all of his career and all of his animosity against the Messenger of Allah, and by the way, when he's living in Medina, and he's attempting to kill the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa by any means, then you know what that means? That means he attempted to assassinate the president. That is what you consider an enemy of the state. And then the, pen the penalty for that is death. In any state. And to confuse that with this guy made poetry, that's why, that's why we have to kill him. And therefore anybody who, does it, who says anything about Islam, anything about the Prophet ﷺ, anything about you know, the Qur'an, we need to kill them. This is craziness. And it, not only that, that's one story, but this actually interestingly is an insight into how limited the thought process of the Muslim has become. Because the Qur'an and the legacy of all prophets is so huge. But you want to take one story, 
which you don't even fully understand, but use that to decide whether you can take someone's life. The entire legacy of prophets is of them being made fun of. Messengers have been made fun of before you. When Allah says they were made fun of, that must not be a small joke. There must be some disgusting things being said about messengers. Muslims have been made fun of before. Yasumunakum. They would dark blacken your faces. The expression in the Arabic suggesting one of the, the worst kinds of insults being hurled towards someone. You know? You're going to get to hear a lot of painful things from the people of the book and the people that have done shirk. They're going to say some hurtful things towards you. Allah, and what is Allah's response? And by the way, that ayah in Ali Imran is after the battle of Uhud. And you're going to hear horrible things coming from them. You're going to hear insightful, hateful, ugly, disgusting speech coming from them. What should you do? Kill anyone who speaks out? No. If you could respond with sabr, and you could have taqwa. So we, we are easy, easy to ignore the entire Qur'an, the entire legacy of all Prophets والسلام, including our own Messenger وسلم, who was insulted and cursed to his face on multiple occasions with him not losing the smile on his face والسلام, let's forget all of that, all of that is mansukh because I want to kill someone this is stupidity and it's an insult against Islam so the, I'm not talking to non-Muslims today, I'm just talking to Muslims. If you have the bug in your head that somehow what they did was Islamic, please get it out of your system and maybe spend some time learning the Book of Allah. Spend some time learning the seerah of this Messenger وسلم, on whose behalf you speak. Because you clearly don't know who this man is that you're standing to defend. And you don't know what it means to defend him alayhi salatu wasalam. The, sec- the first point was criminals are just criminals no matter what. And even if they pretend to come up with religious justification, it changes nothing. It changes nothing. This is not a, this is not a debate in Islamic studies. It's a non-point, it's a moot point. There's no argument to be had. The third point that I want to make is that in fact, speech, hateful speech, condescending speech, insulting speech, speech made against our Prophet wasallam, cartoons made about him or videos made about him, or things said about the Qur'an, these things are offensive. And any people, any people, including Muslims, when they are insulted, when things that they hold sacred are insulted, they have a right to be offended. They have a right to be insulted. That is part of our dignity. If it didn't hurt our feelings, it would mean we, would have, we have no dignity. That somebody can say something about my mother, someone can say something about my father, someone can say something about my messenger والسلام, and it doesn't affect me at all? No, it affects me. It offends me. It angers me. I have a right to be angry. But those are two separate issues. And so what's happening in the media now is these two are being made into one issue. In other words, we are against those people being killed unjustifiably and therefore we are for free speech. So all of it should be celebrated. We are with them no matter what. No, 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 no. For the Muslim, it's not that simple. These are two separate things. We are against people who are killed unjustifiably. And we stand against those who killed them unjustifiably. Absolutely. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, we have a right and we will continue to have the right to be offended by that kind of ignorant and hateful speech. And we will speak out against it. And we will stand against it. There's a way to do it. There's a way to do it, but we're not going to pretend that all free speech is lovely and we're supposed to be able to accept it. No, is Allah angered by the words of people, uh, words of people in the Quran? Absolutely. Are the, mess- are the people, I just mentioned the ayah to you, the believers are going to be hurt by the words of other people. The issue isn't whether we have a right to be offended or not. We do. The issue is how do you respond? How do you react? And that reaction determines everything because our reaction to all things has to submit to the guidance of Allah and His Messenger It is those feelings themselves, those feelings are justifiable. But what happens after those feelings, that may not be justifiable. That's where the problem lies. The final point that I want to bring to your attention in this khutbah is actually something that I personally feel we don't talk about enough. And I think that's the real problem, that's the real point. And the real point is, why do people make fun of Islam? Why do they make fun of it anyway? Why do they insult it? Why are these cartoons being made? Why is there so much much propaganda and so much hate speech towards Muslims, even justified as journalism nowadays, masked as, you know, editorial columns? 
pieces about, you know, and, and the, the framing has become more and more interesting. So it used to be radical Islam, right? So they talked about radical Islam. And they talked about Islam that these fanatics believe in some crazy militant version of Islam where they just want to kill everyone and all this stuff. And they want to, you know, put women in garbage bags and all this stuff. But later, further down the line, the definition of radical has loosened up to the point where if you pray five times, now you're pretty radical, <laughs> you know? So now, radical used to be really crazy, but now they're saying anything that, if you can show Islam, if you look even Muslim too much, if, you, if a woman's wearing a, a hijab, she must be a radical Muslim. If a guy's got a beard, he must be a radical Muslim. We don't have it that bad in the United States, but in Europe, it is pretty bad. And I've been to Europe, and I can tell you, it is pretty bad. It is pretty bad. It is seen as very radical. But the question is, why? We have this mentality, the Muslims have developed this mindset, they're out to get us, man. It's kuffar, man, they hate us. They keep making these cartoons against us. They keep doing this propaganda against us. They hate everything about Islam. They're coming after this, that, the other. They, 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 they. We don't have any time to look in the mirror. I, you know, the prophets, I told you, alayhim salatu wasalam, were also made fun of. I told you that. The sahaba were also made fun of. وَيَسْخَرُونَ مِنَ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا It's in the Qur'an. They make fun of those who believed. The, the kuffar made fun of those who believed. It's in the Qur'an. But the fundamental question is, why were they made fun of? And why are we being made fun of? Is it the same thing? And I argue it is not. Those people were made fun of because that was one of the ways to shut down the work of Islam. One of the ways to stop Islam from spreading because they didn't know what else to do. Islam was so thought-provoking. Islam was so eye-opening. Islam called for justice. It questioned injustices happening in that society. And people were gravitating, young people, old people were gravitating towards Islam. And they didn't know how to stop it. So they came out with the tactic of calling the messenger a liar and that didn't work. Ali Sattu salam. Maybe we can mock these people and just laugh them off so nobody thinks they're a big deal. That was one of their tactics. And when that didn't work, they resorted to other tactics. All of these tactics were there to stop Islam from spreading because it was too powerful. I don't argue that's the case with us. I argue the, the, the ridicule is being made of Islam because of how Muslims appear. How Muslims have, what Muslims have become. How we carry ourselves, what our societies look like. What our streets look like in our neighborhoods, what our homes look like. What our businesses practice are like, what our governments are like. If you want to look at examples of corruption, if you want to look at the exact, exact opposite of a civilized society, travel to the Muslim world, much of it. Hard for us to even be civilized in the parking lot of a masjid, for God's sake. The only time we're organized is when we have to be organized in sufuf, when salat is called. But outside of that, forget about it. Forget it. The, the, the worst kinds of just basic human decency, basic human decency we don't possess. We don't possess it. What is, what is Muslim civilization? We love quoting our history. We love quoting when the Muslims were at the, at, the, at the forefront of invention. When they were leading the universities of the world. When they were, you know, people would come from all over the world to study ilm in Baghdad. And the, the Europeans had lost their literature and the Muslims had it. And they had to come to us to learn it. When Spain was a model for the world. We love quoting those things. What are you going to quote now? What have we done? What have we produced as a people? How have we contributed to the world? The only time we make it to the news is when we blow something up. Or when we're in some kind of chaos or another. This is, why wouldn't, look at it from the outside perspective. These people are crazy. These people are crazy. As a matter of fact, I'm not even going to point the finger at the Muslim world. You know, the, the, the rest of the Ummah. Let's talk about Western Muslims for a moment. We come, we come to our, these societies, and I've dealt with Muslim, the Muslim community in the United States for quite some time. I've had decent interaction with the Muslim community in, in England and in Australia. But let me tell you something. The things you see among the Muslims, subhanAllah. I know Muslim business owners that, that lie on their taxes. Yeah, but I don't want to pay the kafir. Really, you don't want to pay the kafir. You're selling beer. That your Islam didn't show up then, but all of a sudden your wala and bara showed up when you had to pay your taxes. You know? These, these, these Muslims, today, uh, us, not these, us, us, we have such low moral standards. 
such low moral standards. You have Muslim business owners that don't pay decent wages. They don't pay decent wages. They don't even give their wife their mahar. They're complaining about injustices in the world. They don't even have justice inside their home. Inside their home. Why would somebody want to be attracted to Islam? The ayah that I want to share with you today is one of the scariest ayat in the Quran. When it comes to this ummah. رَبَّنَا لَا تَجْعَلْنَا فِتْنَةً لِلَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا Our Rabb, do not make us a fitna. Do not make us a tribulation for those who have disbelieved. In other words, one of the meanings of that ayah is, Ya Allah, don't make us so wretched and so, so, so embarrassing a people, so far from the actual beautiful teachings of Islam, that when non-Muslims see us, they say, why would I want anything to do with Islam? Why would I want to be Muslim? I want to be like these people? This is what I want to be like? They are not justified in them poking fun. But we're not justified when we refuse to look in the mirror. We're not justified. We have to start looking in the mirror. We have to fix this problem. And it's, it's high time we stopped complaining about what the world is doing against us. We are the people of La ilaha illallah. We have on our side Allah Azza wa Jal. His help is greater than any problem. There is no problem bigger, big enough to, to, to not be able to be managed when you have Allah on your side. The problem is we don't want Allah's help. At least we don't, we don't care to earn it. It doesn't just show up for free. It has to be earned. There has to be a transformation that has to happen inside my house. It has to happen inside my family. It has to happen inside my neighborhood. We are, we are not, a, we have lost our moral compass. And I'm not talking about advanced knowledge of deen and fiqh and sharia. I'm talking about basic morality people. Basic, basic morality. We'll have masajid in the United States. And across the world even, where fundraising is taking place. And they're going to they're gonna collect money. And once they collect the money, they're going to say, yeah, we should, we should uh, put this money towards this thing or the other. Well, no, you advertise that you're going to raise these funds for this project, but now you're putting it in another. No, it's okay, it's okay, we have a fatwa. You have a fatwa to be dishonest? Where'd you get that from? But that's okay, we could do that. You know? We could, we could lie even in the name of religion. We could lie, subhanAllah. How could that be? How, can, how, does it, how does it get to that point? How does it get to the point where you have to argue in your home? You have to argue with your parents, argue that dad, really seriously, I really think we should give zakat. No, no, it's okay. And there's an argument happening inside a Muslim home whether they should give zakat or not. This is happening inside the Muslim family. Why would Allah's help come to a people like that? That have been given the most beautiful deen. That have been given the most perfect teachings. And they don't even look in the mirror for one minute, for one day. Just, what am I doing wrong? You know, many of you are not ulama, you're not fuqaha, you're not muftis, you're, you don't have to be. But you know what you do wrong. I know what I do wrong. And we keep overlooking it. Allah will not change the, the state of this people. You know, Allah will not change the state of this ummah. Nope, he will not, he will not do it. Allah Himself says, people say, oh, you just quote the ayat. The ayat are the ultimate reality. There is no greater reality than the ayat. There is no reality you'll find in physics and chemistry and biology that you will find in the ayat of the Quran. Inna Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusihim. Allah will not change the state of a people until they transform what is within their own selves. Ma bi anfusihim. There is something wrong inside of ourselves. Allah's answer to what is wrong with the ummah is something is wrong inside people. That is Allah's answer to what is wrong with this ummah today. When he says, وَأَنْتُمُ الْأَعْلَوْنَا إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ You are going to be in the supreme position, if in fact you have true iman, if you are true believers. Now clearly we're not in the supreme position, so something must be wrong with iman. Because Allah is never wrong. Allah is just not wrong. This is a tragedy. One after another, after another, after another. And it's not going to stop, and we know it's not going to stop. We know it's not going to stop. The only thing we can do, instead of being overwhelmed by this flood of tragedy, and constantly just figuring out a way to justify to somebody, you know, how we're not crazy. Because by the way, they're going to think we're crazy no matter what. They're going to, they're, you can't impress them. You could try. Messengers tried too. If messengers weren't good enough for them, we're definitely not good enough for them. Let me tell you. There's no way to impress them. No matter how, how, how we do right, the people who hate will always hate. 
The people who make fun will always make fun. But we better give them the right reasons to make fun of us. The right reasons are we stand by Islam. We are the people of reason. We are the people of intelligence. We are the people. The greatest threat of Islam was not its force. And this is a, I promise this is my last point. The greatest threat of Islam was not its force. Was not the sword. Was not the weapon. The greatest threat of Islam was the power of its ideas and how it challenged injustice head on and how it questioned the integrity of other philosophies, other ideas. How can you think like that? How can you act like that? How can you judge like that? Why don't you think? How do you make your decisions? This was a reason, this is a religion of ad'u ilallahi ala basira. I call to Allah with eyes open, a religion of thought. We are no longer a thoughtful people, so Islam is no longer. What we think this, the threat of Islam in the West, the threat of Islam is its militancy. The militancy is nothing. This is nothing. The real threat to the Quraysh, Quraysh were rattled, not at Badr, but back in Mecca. They were shaken up just by the ayat, the word of Allah was enough. It was, it was enough to take a tradition that was there for thousands of years, and it was rattled just by a few words of Allah. Just by a few words. Some things, ha some things happen, we're not connected with that word anymore. You know, when somebody wants to win an argument, when two people have an argument, and you don't have a response, then you get angry. And you start yelling. And when you start yelling, it is proof that you lost. When you, when you in an argument start yelling, it is proof that you lost because you don't have a reasonable answer left. And it frustrated you, so you got angry. And when two people have an argument and you lost and you hit the other, that is also proof that you lost. Because you could not defeat him with words, so you figured you could try to defeat him with your hand. This is actually indication that you're not strong enough in what you have to say. My argument to you is, our deen, Allah has given us words, there are no stronger words. There is no stronger message. We don't have to resort to anything else. And when we do, it is as though we are admitting that this isn't strong enough. But it is. We're not strong enough because we're not connected to this word enough. And we have to, we have to be the people that produce the most intellectual responses. The most reasonable responses. The ones that don't, the, the ones that challenge the immorality of the world in the most profound and thought-provoking way. We're the ones that are supposed to engage in the most deep conversation with the agnost, with the atheist, with the Christian, with, you know, with all of them, with all of them. Their accusation against religion, you know what it is, it's been there for centuries in Europe now and now all over the world. Religious people are close-minded. Religious people are fanatical. Religious people are intolerant. Religious people cannot take criticism. Religious people are not open to conversation. So if you get rid of religion, you'll have an open-minded society where people can think for themselves. This is their accusation. And you know what? It holds true for the, Christian, for the Christendom that had invaded Europe for centuries. It was true. But the Islam that Allah gave His Messenger وسلم, is the exact opposite of that. It is the religion that encourages dialogue. Hatu burhanakum in kuntum sadiqeen. Bring your evidences. Why don't you give me all of your criticisms against the Qur'an? I would invite you to bring all of your criticisms. How is a book asking people not just to have faith, but to please collect all of your criticisms and bring them? This is what you call open-mindedness. The book is calling to open-mindedness. We're the ones that are closed-minded. We're the ones. And we have to empower this ummah again by opening up our minds, by opening up this book and thinking the way it wants us to think. To show that religion is not a way to close the mind and close the eyes and clo you know, close the hearts. It is the way to open the mind and to engage in dialogue and to bring civilization to humanity. They think the solution is when you get rid of religion. And we're saying the solution is when you bring the true religion. Yes, false religion will bring oppression. False religion will bring oppression. But when you bring the deen of Allah, it's a thing of beauty. If we don't show them that, who will? That's why Allah put you and me on this earth. To be members of this ummah is an honor, it's not a small thing. We are carrying collectively one-fifth of the ummah's population on our shoulders, the burden that was placed on the shoulders of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is what you and I carry every single day, whether we admit it or not. And when we don't do something about that burden, and we don't show humanity what it is, we're, we're, we're in trouble. Not just with the authorities or with the media, 
we're in trouble with Allah. I pray that Allah Azza wa Jal makes us a people of Quran once again. That it teaches us not just, we, that we, we learn to think the way Allah wants us to think. And that we are able to represent in our character, in our communities, in our business dealings, in our personal lives, in our speech, in our demeanor. We're able to depict what makes this deen so perfect, what makes it so beautiful. May Allah Azza wa Jal shine the light of this guidance into all of our hearts and keep it strong and make it stronger and stronger. And may Allah make the generation of young people real leaders for this community that are going to bring a, an age of light out of this age of darkness. بارك الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات والذكر الحكيم